welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rita McGrath, and I'm actually here with another Rita, Rita Kakati Shah, who is um, our, our guest for this week. Um, and she has written this very interesting book called The Goddess of Go-Getting, uh, which looks like this. Um, and I've been thumbing through it and making notes and everything. Um, and Rita's thesis is uh, really that um, that that you know, no matter who you are or what your background is, that there are ways of forging a path uh, of confidence and growth, um, you know, in any number of different, very difficult situations. So uh, delighted that you're here and uh, please do use the chat for questions. We try to uh, track it. If we don't get to all of your questions during the session, uh, we'll record them and I'll work with Rita to uh, get those uh, answered later. It's very strange for me to be talking to another Rita, I have to say, <laughs> it's not that usual a name. <laughs> So welcome, welcome, Rita Kakati Shah. Um, so maybe start off with just your journey, because it's a, a very interesting story. Sure, yeah. Well, thank you again, uh, Rita, for having me. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here amongst um, you all. So yeah, just a little bit about my journey. I'm born and brought up in the UK um, from a small town called Hornchurch, which is, which is in northeast London. So born and bred red there. And um, I did my schooling, I did um, university in London, I went to King's College London. And um, actually during my time um, at school as well, I was, I was always very outgoing. I love traveling. I love sort of just doing things that just took me closer to nature and, and whatnot. So I came across um, um, lots of outdoor activities at the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme and, and army training as it happened, which wasn't so common for a almost adolescent um, girl of South Asian background, but it was something that I really thoroughly enjoyed. And I was actually really good at it, you know, um, doing things like, you know, going around and um, going on with these patrols and sort of activities. And I was actually really good at it. I was the only girl um, for a long time. And um, there were other girls later on, but certainly in a senior rank. And I just loved it. It just felt so normal and there was nothing out of place. And I loved it. So that went on to me uh, actually getting an army scholarship later on for university um, to be an army doctor, as it happened. Um, my parents come from the medical background and um, anyone from, I guess, a South Asian background could probably share this or other sort of um, you know, background as well that, you know, you sometimes quite often, um, I would say gently sort of pushed in the direction of studying medicine or accountancy or engineering or law those are kind of professions that are some somewhat preferred um from and an, the old generation my parents generation so I was like sure yeah okay I'll, I'll, I'll if I'm going to be a doctor why not be an army doctor you know so um when when I trained at Sandhurst um and I was about to embark on this medical journey started at medical school and then realized actually very soon that gosh I've never really enjoyed my biology classes or like any of that so no wonder I just don't like anatomy and this and I was finding myself to think that it just didn't feel right but the way schooling was done certainly in my day Rita and I'm sure everyone here can um, attest to this is that it was very spoon-fed certainly in my day you know you learn I certainly back then now my memory is an absolute sieve but back then I had a pretty good memory um, a lot of it is just memorizing things and you regurgitate it when it comes to the exam and I was pretty good at that so that thought, well, yeah, sure, I'll do this. Why not? But now I was at university. I was at the Royal London and um, St. Bart, St. St. Bartholomew School of Medicine and Dentistry and realized you're kind of on your own. You have to make your own notes. You've got to figure out what from what the professor is talking about is relevant to you and somehow summarizing those. And I was not taught that at school. So um, this was a challenge for me. And I tried to d dissect all the information. But I realized it was just things that I just didn't. It wasn't for me. Um, but here's the thing, I had a good memory. So come exam time, I would memorize and regurgitate. And I was actually on the <laughs> on the dean's list. I was like, you know, an oh, distinction student. So my professor at the time was like, well, Rita, don't leave, you can't, you're, you're doing really well. But I didn't think um, anyone quite understood what it was that I was, you know, maybe there's a way I, I couldn't convey it. And I certainly didn't know how to talk to my parents about it because I thought, hey, I want to let them down. I didn't know what to do here. So long story short, it took me two years to pluck up the courage to actually go and have a chat. I finished, I actually came to the end of preclinical medicine before starting on the clinical path. I said, okay, look, enough's enough. Learned a lot. I did, you know, it was all up here. It'd probably be gone the next week, but I didn't tell them that. But, you know, it was, I just thought I needed to do something else that was, was me. It did not feel like me. 
So I went back to, to ground again and I thought, okay, well, what, what do I now do? You know, I broke it to my parents. Yes, there was a bit of shock, hurt, not understanding what was going on. Um, but I felt kind of on my own at that point because I thought I've got to figure out what that journey entails, you know, um, but I knew I had to do it. So um, King's College London was part of the University of London. So I actually explored sort of different courses and I thought, what do I like? Well, I love languages. You know, French was something that, you know, I, I loved. Um, I loved mathematics and I loved art. I've always had a bit of a, you know, painting, artistic you know, um, tendency to my background. And then I thought, okay, well, French, I, I'm in Paris every other weekend anyway, um, and, and traveling around. So technically, if I'm immersed, that's really the best way of picking up the language. Art, I thought, you know what, that's something that's in my heart. That is something that I, I can do. And then, you know, I can learn and, and, and actually take little courses here and there. But mathematics, that's something that's not so easy to just pick up out of a textbook that's better to actually be taught it in a formal setting. So I thought, okay, mathematics is it. Um, met with the head of the math department at the time and told my story and he was sure, yeah, come come on board, join the, the maths, uh, maths contingency and, and get started. Um, and then a week before term started, um, we had the prospectus that the physical prospectus came to the post. And I thought, gosh, what is this business management? Um, and I spoke to the maths tutor again and, and sort of said, hey, what, what is this? And a week before term started, he switched my degree over from mathematics to mathematics and business management. So that's where that story started. Loved it because now I was studying without any pressure, not caring what others would think, not caring about what I could do after that, because I was interested and I wanted to learn. I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing about management, but I wanted to explore it. And nothing, Rita, felt so good than just having that feeling. And then, you know, the results soon came. I didn't have to memorize and regurgitate. I genuinely had a desire. So it was more creative that would respond. It was something that just felt so right. Um, and it was during these creative times that I stumbled upon a careers fair. I actually went with um, a friend of mine. She was in the year above. I didn't know what I wanted to do in my career. I was just wanted to learn. So she went into the careers fair. I stayed outside. And I got chatting to this lady who had just come out. Um, I was chatting for a good 45 minutes because my friend was still inside. Um, just about life, about hit this, that and everything about, you know, what do you think about this? And oh, did you see that in the news? Well, what do you think is going to happen there? You know, just a nice little chat about things like that. Um, my friend came back and then this lady gave me her business card and said it was great chatting. I had a great time too. She said, I'd love you to come and meet some of my colleagues. We, our offices are really just down the road. She was the head of global recruiting at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> in a nutshell that's a great story yeah, how the journey started Rita so there's been so many journeys like this um that I guess by chance but it's not by chance it's almost like because something took you there there was an actual passion there was something there because had I not been in the right moment or something we couldn't have had that great conversation you know so you know I had 32 uh, conversations slash interviews after I met with her it took me a good two weeks to actually get back to her because back then we, you know, we didn't have iPhones. There was no like, you know, even Blackberries, you had to sign up to use the computer room. It was a good old DSL connection. There was no broadband or Wi-Fi of any of that. So you had to sign up, it took me a couple of weeks to get there, log on to your email, forgot my password, I had to go to the head of tech to figure out how to, you know, get in all of that stuff. So eventually kind of managed to get in contact and then organize these interviews. And then, yeah, the rest is history. Started my, um, started as an intern, summer analyst um, on the trading floor. Um, I was pan, in pan-European sales trading. Um, so again, the, at the time, the only only um, female on my team um, and one of very, very few men on the, on the uh, trading floor full stop. But I just embraced that journey because I wanted to learn. I didn't join thinking I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I was just so interested with everything. So I just fell right in. I immersed myself um, and, you know, did that and you know, 10 years later you know um you know um got a very various involved um in various um initiatives during my time at the firm and that's i guess rita how i got involved in diverse and inclusion initiatives um back in the early 2000s when it wasn't called that mm -hmm. um it's a term we use now but at, back then you know, so i was a connector i'm a people person i love meeting people and my question is, where are all the other women? Where are the other folks of different minority backgrounds? And why can't we talk to each other in a different way? Um, I'd just come back from a backpacking trip to Guatemala. And I was like, I want to practice my business Spanish. Um, so I spoke to the Latin American desk and it was great. We got to chat. But everybody at that desk was from 
a Latin American country. So there in itself, I thought, well, you know what? I have the passion. We should do more to get folks from different backgrounds to come come in. So while it was diverse, was it that inclusive? So that's where that piece came in. Like, how would you get folks from different backgrounds who have a genuine interest and passion to get included and feel that sense of like belonging uh, and whatnot? So lots of stories like that. Um, but yeah, fast forward 10 years. And then I transitioned into the pharmaceutical healthcare industry um, by chance, actually. Um, a former colleague, I'd say, at King's College London, who happened to be the, um, he's now the former chair of um, Institute of Psychiatry and Neurology at King's, said, hey, Rita, you've got a business background. I'm just setting something up in the clinical trials space in, in Delaware. Will you help me? <laughs> this question I had, not where is Delaware, but what's Delaware? You know, is that a product? <laughs> is it a bar of chocolate? What is this thing? You know, uh, <laughs> long story short, that's how I got my feet wet in a completely different industry. But I loved it. I was in business development. I love traveling. I love finding out new things. You know, coming from the background of, you know, in a, the corporate world where all of your I's are dotted and T's are crossed to the extreme opposite, where there are no documents with anything to cross or dot. For me, that was the next challenge. And I loved it. Um, I could really make a difference. So I fell into that industry, um, traveled here, there and everywhere. Those travels took me to New York, where I met my husband, um, got married. Um, you know, five weddings later, we have family all over the world, uh, settled in New York and now have two small children um, who are not that small anymore. Um, an almost eight year old daughter and an almost 10 year old son. And um, when they were very young, I took about three and a half, four years off to raise them, Rita, and realized that, gosh, this by far is the most challenging of all of the careers and jobs I've ever done. Um, not only are you working 24 seven, but you can't take that sick day. It's a Saturday morning. I went out lying. Ooh, it doesn't work that way ever again, you know. So just things like that. I learned a lot, but I also learned, and here's the thing, that there are a lot of professional skills that I really became a pro at that I didn't actually pick up or learn when I was actually in the paid salaried workforce. Mm -hmm. Communication being one of them. You know, I thought, gosh, I can communicate. I can stand in front of a room full of people or... I can go through that presentation. I don't realize that that's only a touching the surface of communication. Communication is listening. It's mm -hmm. empathy. It's being able to read the room. These little kids who can't talk to you when they're babies, you've got to figure out what's going on and understand and make those decisions for them. And that is a skill that is directly relevant to the paid workforce. That in negotiation, I, I tell people all the time, if you can negotiate with a toddler or later in life with an adolescent, take that conviction to your next interview or boardroom meeting, you know? So it just seems like that. I learned a lot in this journey, but then I realized there's so many gaps in that with how the perception is in the paid working world. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there is a perception that if you chose not to go straight back to work after the six weeks non-existent, you know, um, maternity leave, then you are not a career person. You are not passionate about work. You've chosen one over the other. And it was things like that. I thought this perception needs to change and that's initially why I started UMA mm -hmm. a platform for empowerment a platform to enhance communication a platform to really become that diverse equity inclusion strategy consultancy from companies for academic institutions for policy forums to really really sort of work on those elements for in particular for women and minorities mm -hmm. so that's really a nutshell of uh, how I came to do what I'm doing <laughs> that's, that's a great yes. <laughs> one of the um one of the, the the anecdotes in your book that I found sort of very telling was uh, that you went to a networking women's event um with with the phrase S A H M you know on your on your name card and this woman asks you uh you know what does that stand for oh a stay at home mother and she just basically turns her back on you and I thought that was so interesting because um you know when I, when I was at school and I'm, I'm I guess I'm a little older than you are but um you know the, the theory was let's let's give people choice right if they want to be work at home you know stay at home moms then let them do that if they want to work let them do that but it was all about choices and then what seems to have happened in the intervening years is we've developed all these judgments about the choices people make and you know I think what's challenging is we all make choices that are going to be relevant at different times in uh, you know in our lives so so one of the things that you talked about is um uh, that that very often the kind of exposure we get to diversity and inclusion 
theories uh, actually has the opposite effect. It doesn't really help bring us together. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, so it's it's a very interesting term. And I, I see that now in the work that I do. You know, as, as I mentioned, I fell into sort of DEI space just naturally, but sort of thinking about creating value, creating that sense of community. Now I see it's become it's become more of a thing and it's actually can be divisive in the way it's done. So for me, ultimately, you know, what is diversity? It's all of us. It's the way you think, it's the way you do things, it's how who we are. And it's, if you are in a company, it's the clients that you serve. Is it a diverse client base? Is that, you know, are you serving them the best you can? How are you serving them? Like, do you have thought leaders that represent who you're trying to support? So that in itself is the diversity there. Um, for me, the inclusion piece is ultimately, do people feel valued? Do they feel like they belong? You know, there was uh, research done uh, by Career Builder some, some years ago um, and follow up actually by, um, you know, Harvard Business uh, Review that, 79% of people, when they leave the workforce, the reason is because they don't feel valued. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the belief is, oh, is it, is it because of pay? Is it because of promotion? Is it some sort of unhappiness? Ultimately, what is that unhappiness? If you feel valued, if you feel this is your place, like you belong, that what you say counts, you make a difference, you're going to stay. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the times I felt it myself in the corporate world. And, and you know, you are doing things that isn't relevant to anything you've done in your degree whatsoever. But, you know, it's the people that surround you. Do you get along with them? It's a team, you know. Do you feel like what you say counts? Do, you, do people even listen to you? That's the reason you're there day in, day out. You feel, you know, it drives you. But if you don't feel that level of drivenness, if you don't feel that level, something is going to make you leave. And it could be little, little things, uh, Rita, that, you know, you walk into a room, um, you're about to meet your boss, you have a meeting scheduled, and for whatever reason, they've got something else going on. They might have an emergency but they're looking down. They're not even making eye contact because they're, oh my gosh, an emergency is something. Someone's school just sent a message and they have to read it, but you've walked in at that moment and they don't make eye contact. You add those little things up. They feel like, you know, this person feels like there's too much going on. They're overwhelmed with something else. The employee that's walked in thinks, that person won't even look at me. They won't talk to me. You know, so these little things build up and you don't feel valued. So um, for me, ultimately, the whole lesson is about what do we do to drive those sort of elements of, the, it's the little things that count. You know, I would say um, confidence, communication are at the center of all of that, you know, where these days there's a big focus. And I talk about several examples in my book of how, you know, quite often you feel like you're the odd one out. And that is linked to, to diversity in many ways, but also inclusion, you know, feeling the odd one out. We all have, you know, I, I define minority as, as being more textbook definition of minority. Minority to me isn't just gender. It's not just ethnic minority. It's if you are in the left of any situation. And the reason I say that, Rita, is because this book is for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want leaders picking it up and thinking, gosh, well, I that. Yes, you are actually, because at some point you may have walked into a barbecue and you're a vegetarian or you might you know be somebody who ca casually happens to be of a certain religion but you walk into an orthodox celebration or you're just not dressed for the right occasion we've all done that at some point you know so at that point you feel like the source thumb out you are in the minority and that feeling is what drives this whole conversation and we've all been there in various spectrums so it's understanding those feelings what drives makes you kind of more empathetic to think gosh what did I do? Did I get really anxious and nervous and say the wrong thing because I just felt weird? Or did I deal with the situation and sort of just go straight in there? So it's things like that, these little nuggets of life, which actually equips all of us to react differently to these situations. Mm -hmm. um, and how we react comes from earlier in life. You know, I, there's a chapter in my book called um, The Rules of the Playground. And I talk about this starts right from childhood. I observe my kids, you know, when I run around or I did certainly when we were in the city. Um, and they, they fall down. When do you get back up versus when do you call for the teacher? When do you give, give up the swing or the slide? You've been coming up and down so many times. Can't you see there's a line behind you? You know, so it's things like that. Learning to read the room, that social interaction, being likable without making an effort, just being a people person comes through practice, comes naturally to some. Some people look at things and practice skill sets later on. But it's all of these nuggets that make an absolute difference later on to this whole chat this whole area of DEI that we look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the um, things that you talk about in the book, I'm just to see if I can find it here, is um, 
five ways that you can practice empathy, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and, and so just to do the, the summary, right? So one is reach out to somebody who's new and ask how they're doing, find out what the biggest challenges they are, the biggest misconceptions they have, have a culture event, tell a member of your team the first impression you had of them when you first met them, played the, I love this one, play if I were the CEO game and uh, celebrate the holidays of people from different teams. And what really struck me about each of those examples is, you know, these are not expensive things, right? I mean, they're not, they're not difficult things. They just require a bit of time and effort. And I guess what we're learning so much in organizations is that so many of the things that make the biggest difference are actually not related to how much budget you have or how much you know, you're know you investing there. They're a question of mindfulness and, and paying attention. Um, yeah. And to that point, Rita, and exactly what you just said. So one of my clients um, just had their Christmas party mm -hmm. and they're still pretty much hybrid where actually um, a lot of people actually came in to the physical Christmas party, but some couldn't make it. They were just just can't make it in for you know what a reason they're more remote and they have been since the pandemic and things like that so well you know you could do little easy fixes you have a certain budget anyway for the party you've already carved that aside folks are going to be there but then what about the ones that can't make it what's happening to them they again they might feel left out like oh i can't go there or they see pictures up later on or someone's posted something on instagram or the office talk the next day whether it's remote they're just going to feel left out they could be little token gestures like if the, everyone's wearing a certain theme or having these antler ears or having a thing, you can just send them a memento and a little swig of whatever they may enjoy or something they may want to eat that's been celebrated at the party because it's the little things that counts. It shows them that you out of sight is not out of mind, right? And it's the little things like that can make a difference. So they did that and apparently it went, you know, it was a rave, it was a great success. And they kind of think, wow, thank you for not forgetting us because. It's those things. The whole point is to bring people together at these parties, not leave people out. Mm -hmm. So to your point, it's just the little things like that. It shows the empathy. It shows you're celebrating others. It shows you haven't forgotten them, mm -hmm. um, which is so easy, especially in this new hybrid era that we're in. So what do you see as companies getting right when they're talking about, you know, bringing people back, bringing people around, um, uh, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you're you're seeing people get right. And of course we don't know. I mean, we, we just don't know where this is all going to land in terms of, are we all going to go back to the office? Are we going to be hard time? I mean, it's pretty clear the genie's out of the bottle in terms of, you know, nine to five, whatever it is, four days a week or five days a week. Um, a lot of companies have now departed from that, but it's also clear that we're, we're also learning there are things we're missing, right. By not being together. So, so where, where do you, in the clients that you're working with, where do you see that landing? Yeah. I mean, uh Quite often, you know, clients would ask, well, which should we do this? Should we do that? And I said, well, you know your business the best. There are certain situations um, and, you know, think about finance right now. And, you know, folks on the trading floor, they, a lot of them have been summoned to come back into the office now um, because that's the way they want to run their business. But if that's the way they were doing, how are they helping and making sure that everybody still feels that it's where they need to be and whatnot. And what are they doing for folks that need to leave early the occasional day here and there? So it's about sort of coming up with these sort of um, inclusive options and not forgetting that it exists. Similarly, if somebody's working hybrid and that's happening a lot these days, we have a lot of people coming in say three days a week, companies are actually sometimes saying, we want you in two or three days a week, especially when we have team meetings, it's great to be in the room at the same time. But the other days you can absolutely work remotely if, if that's what you want to do. Um, and for those sort of situations, the ones that are working remotely, it's important not to forget them. You know, there's, there was the old assumption that you're working remotely, you're not getting any work done. You're doing everything but working. And then that changed as the pandemic came around because everybody was seeing everybody and their lives plus ones on Zoom, on camera. There was a leak. There was this. There was a pet running across. There was a baby crying. Whatever was happening, everybody was seeing everybody's lives. And there was a whole different level of empathy where you kind of think, gosh, I understand that person's perspective better than now I understand that person. You know, you see these real life examples. So um, it's just about not forgetting. That's one of the hardest things, because if you're all remote, you're always all on Zoom together. So you're in the same boat, so to speak. So you meet at a certain time. In that sense, the moderator needs to make sure that everybody around the room is having their voice heard. And it's up to them as the moderator to kind of bring people's voices out. If you're more introverted, naturally making sure that they feel heard in the best way that they like to communicate back. So figuring out those sort of things. If you're hybrid, do not ever forget that there's people sometimes on the phone, sometimes 
remotely on Zoom. So just make sure to kind of include them in conversations, whether it's like, well, what? let's start with those that aren't in physically in the room. What do you think about this? Or what about this discussion? Where do you think? Or you know what? You had me a really good point here. Bring them into the conversation. So I think, it, you know, there isn't advice you can say you should do this or you should do that. It's up to companies because they know their business and their clients best. But once they do that, there are so many little things, all, all these little things they could do to best um, bring people together and making sure they feel connected um, the entire time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Frank Kalberg, who's one of our regular uh, visitors, is curious to know your view on if you were to redesign your educational experience or even think about what your two children are going to be experiencing in terms of their education. Uh, are there specific shifts you'd like to see made? That's a great question. You know what? Um, in my day, it was very just examination test focus. Um, what I see my kids a lot is the extreme opposite. You know, everybody gets a gold star. Everybody wins, even if they fail. You know, it's I'm exaggerating here to give the example. So for me, an educational process, and I spend a lot of time actually with, with students later on at university level and preparing them through mentoring and coaching for the real world out there is a bit of bit of both. So when I talk um, about the um, rules of the playground, a lot of it is learned right there and then. So at the school level, I want to be able to see that kids falling down, try to problem solve themselves, not necessarily literally falling, but sort of, but you know, if they get into a, an issue, not always going to the teacher thinking, okay, well, how, how can I resolve that myself? What can I do? Oh, somebody's taking that, that's like, well, how do you get it back without just snatching it away? Are there ways around that? What do you do? How do you, you snatch it away? How does somebody react? So it's all about sort of figuring out ways of how do you um, deal with these real life situations from a young age onwards with a mixture of, yeah, a little bit of, you know, you can be wrong and that's fine and not crumble when somebody tells you you're wrong, you know, because unfortunately what I see happening a lot is that, um, because everybody is embracing um, different levels of, um, they call it failure, but it's not even actually being taught to fail. Um, nobody quite knows what to do and deal with it. So if they've been told no later on when they're applying for an internship or applying to college or something later on, and it's a no, sometimes they just feel so disheartened, they give up rather than, you know what, you need to be doing that. So I'd like that lesson to start a lot earlier. You know, picking for teams, picking for this. Oh. You get picked. Okay, well, hard luck. Let's see what happens next time. Oh, you never get picked. Okay, how can we change your strategy so someone notices you? You know what? Shift a little bit there. Stand in the front. Oh, you're not. You're not. You're not one of the tallest members of the class. My daughter. She's little. She's tiddly. I'm like, hey, just go stand over there and put your hand up. Got picked the next day. You know things like that. So I think it's real life examples of um, practical experiences, case study work. It's. Um, finding out and embracing and opening yourselves up to outer news activities that isn't just very US centric, I find is an issue as well. Um, certainly my day growing up in the UK, you know, we got exposed to things of news and um, views from all over the world. We used to go to debate club. Um, it was something that was part of our curriculum. I would love to see something like that introduced here in all schools, you know, because it makes you force you to think from both sides all the time. Uh, an example is, you know, you're given a topic, um, you go home and you have to prepare for it. To prepare for it, you have to read both sides of the story. And then you come in, you think you're on one side, but it could get flipped last minute to say, okay, what did you prepare? Okay, you're going to be on the other side. And it's things like that that happen so often. A, it helps you with public speaking, but it also helps you with presenting. It helps you understand and have empathy, which you don't necessarily understand at that age. But as you go through life and later on, you are automatically trying to listen and think what is the other person saying first before you react? These are real life skills that can be learned earlier by little techniques like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Robert Livingston, who uh, has been a guest of mine and also um, teaches at Harvard, um, and he cites research which shows that to really develop and grow, uh, what human beings need is a combination of support and challenge. 
that yeah. we need to confront obstacles. We need to have obstacles that we overcome and we need to have the, the confidence that we can overcome them. And what I would observe, uh, certainly my generation of parents, I think has erred way too much. We've over-indexed on the support dimension and under-indexed on the challenge dimension. You know, when I when I was growing up, my parents' basic position was, you know, we'll, we'll see you at dinner time. But up, up to then, it's up to you. And what I observe um, a lot of my, my generation of parents having done is, you know, every minute is scheduled, right? It's it's play dates, it's schedules, it's and everybody gets awards, you know, most improved or whatever. And I think that's actually in the long run not that helpful because children don't learn the struggle. You know, they don't learn that sometimes things require effort. Sometimes you have to stick with things. Sometimes things don't go your way. Sometimes you have to have a certain amount of persistence. Um, and I think that that can be a big um, negative, you know, and and I, I love it that in your book, you, you know, you talked about all these things that, you know, other people might have regarded as rejection or a cause to stop. And, and um, you know, you just sort of figured out a different way to stick with it, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, so there's a question from Juan Miguel, another of our regulars. Uh, Since the world probably will enter a recession next year, what recommendations should leaders consider for their teams when stress time comes, because then people tend to focus on resources, not so much on other people. That that you know, spare ten minutes of thinking about who should be included, for example. Um, you know, when you're under extreme pressure, that's what can get lost. Yeah, no, a great question, and I want to actually answer that by going back to um, as we hit the pandemic, because if you think about it, there are somewhat similarities to ha what happened then, right? It was all overnight. We went from everything was fine. Suddenly the news comes out and then boom, everybody's now working from home. And it's like shock for this, that and the other. And then you saw things like research come out from, you know, McKinsey, where, you know, cited that um, one in four women um, were actually leaving their jobs because of the stress that they were feeling at having to work from home, but also work at home as well. And there was not the even, they didn't see it as the even split of, of labor like that. So I think as we... Um, make different considerations for what may or may not come next year you have to also consider that we've been in that situation in a different way we just called it the pandemic back then you know in the sense that you know there were different shifts that can you know be cost savers like you know the remote hybrid experience for example and you can still engage people in the workplace now the other thing i want to share on this note actually is that when we think of um workplace culture, work, workplace efficiency, how what to do as a, as a leader when you're going into different situations. Don't forget the home dynamic as well. It all is interconnected. You know, historically, um, not even historically, now, um, there's a big focus for the workplace. What are you doing for teams? What are you doing here? What are you doing there? But then when I started the McKinsey study, that was also showing that, well, what, what is going on at home? That in a way is a different type of workplace for lack of a better word, you know, but we are not necessarily treating it the same way. What makes work work? Communication, being transparent, delegation. You don't do that at home. Something's going to crumble. So I take that same example to the home situation. I said, okay, look at these one in four women that have cited this. Let's go into the raw data, access the data, what they've actually said and what's going on. Ah, okay. Examples that came up and I did this in my own coaching clients as well. Things like I'm doing this, but I'm also having to figure out the remote schooling, or I'm also having to do the laundry because my partner did it, but it wasn't done the way I wanted to do it, or whatever it was. And then you dissect the different examples and think, okay, there is obviously a breakdown of communication. The task at hand is like the task at work. Is that okay? I'm going to give you an example. Do the do the dishes, say right. Um, one partner might think doing the dishes is turn on the dishwasher, it beeps, I've done the dishes because it beeped, I just turned it on. The other partner might have meant by do the dishes, well, you turn it on, it beeps, you take it out, you let the steam out, you come back after 20 minutes, you hand dry and put everything away. If that process isn't communicated by what that task entails, there is going to be a breakdown of communication and therefore disappointment that the level of completion hasn't been reached. It's the same at work. If you're not reaching the end goal because you haven't clarified what the task is, something will break down. So it's a matter of being clear in terms of the communication. It's also a matter of delegating in different ways as well. So for example, in the workplace where you delegate, you can also do that at home as well. In my personal example, because you know, um, have had two, 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 two young children, we treat it like a game. I said, all right, 
um, this week, and my husband and I, we equally kind of um, do these things. It's all uh, like, okay, either my daughter will partner with me or my son, and you know, one of a pair of us are on laundry duty, the other one's on dishes duties, and we just we just do it. It's not even a chore anymore. It's just something you do. You just fit it into your day. You structure your day around it. We just do it as part. It becomes the norm because they're used to doing that and they have been doing it for now a couple of years. It's for them. It's not unusual to do things like that. There's no gender in that. There's no this. It's just something they have to do. You know, we all pull our way around the house in during the pandemic in particular, you know, um, and it's something that we've kept going. So I think a lot of the issues that I see that can be addressed is because of, um, I would say that transparency, that communication, that self-belief, that confidence piece that actually needs to go hand in hand with what's going on at home as well as in the workplace. So much, a much more integrated view of how those things fit yeah. together. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about Uma. So you had this fabulous career at Goldman Sachs, then you went off and did the pharma thing, then the mom thing. And what, why did you decide not to go back into a corporate setting and to start your own gig? Yeah, you know, Rita, that's a really, really good question. And I was for so long thinking that's what I'm going to do. I mean, initially, and this is what a lot of my clients do, when you have taken some sort of hiatus for whatever reason, um, and you're thinking of going back to something, it's very natural. The first thing is what you used to do before. That's the first thing you think of. And quite often you start to go down that path. Think, okay, I came from a finance background or I came from a law background. That's what I'm going to go because that's what I know and do. So um, I was, you know, meeting friends of mine for coffees. You know, I was actually pretty good at keeping in touch with um, former colleagues of mine. So met for a few coffees with, you know, cross industry so in finance um, as well as and on the equities and fixed income side because I you know work, worked in both areas while I was at the firm and in the pharmaceutical industry you know so and many of these conversations then I thought to myself I learned a lot of lessons and things and I thought okay well there's a big gap with what I was seeing and even some of the conversations I was having you know I remember one of my former colleagues um, in the nicest way possible um, said but Rita you you know, how, how can you show that you're now like a, a go-getter again, you know? Um, and one of the reasons I wrote the book Goddess of Go-Getting was because of that. How can you show you're go-getting? Because you, you left the workforce. Rather than you transitioned into something different, you left. It's almost like it's very black and white. It's mm -hmm. very cut and dry. If you left, you are not passionate about work. How can you be a career person? You're not the kind of mindset we want. So that was a very subtle way of me thinking, it's actually the furthest from the truth. There's not someone more kind of like go-getting or passionate or ambitious than me and, and others in my same boat, but that was the perception. So I'm thinking what can be done? So either I go back to a similar role that I did before, absolutely I can, but I couldn't stop that feeling of how do I change the perception? What can I do to change the perception? You mentioned Rita in my book, I mentioned the example before I made the decision that I was gonna start Uma, I went to a networking event in the city. It was a women's networking event. And, you know, I've managed to fit myself into a pre-pregnancy dress. I was like, hurrah, uh, put on put on some heels, which oh, I couldn't fit into them properly. So I was hobbling the whole night. So they weren't very comfortable. But, you know, um, went to this event and everyone was writing their names and their professions, what they do, where they worked. So as you mentioned, I put S-A-H-M on my name tag. And the first guest over there, you know, we kind of um, chatted and she asked me, goes, oh, where do you work? What's S-A-H-M? And I said, oh, you mean stay at home mom? Then she just literally, kid you not, just turned around and walked away. And that was it. Wow. Look, whoa, this was the first event I'd been to at all. I had confidence issues when I was stay at home mom. There were times where, you know, I would think, you know, when people would ask me like, you know, oh, but what are you reading right now? I'm like, oh, you're Thomas the Tank Engine, good night galaxy. I don't have time to read the news and figure out what's going on. Right I just literally, I was covered in diapers and burp cloths the whole time. You kind of are when you're a young new parent. Um, and then so I was thinking like, you know, my husband would say, hey, let's get the babysitter out tonight. Let's do date night. Or I've got, you know, meeting with some clients. Why don't you come along? You meet some old, you know, clients as well. I was petrified, Rita. You know, because I thought, what if they were to ask me questions like, what are you doing? What else? And what else do you do? Oh, are you just a mom? Mm -hmm. Rather than, you know what, it's 24 seven and then plus, I can tell you all the stuff I'm doing. But I didn't have the confidence to realize that the skills I picked up back then, communication, negotiation, just being one, two or very, very few, were above and beyond anything I'd ever done when I was in the paint workplace. I didn't have that conviction back then to recognize it. So I came from that background, having that self-doubt, 
having that, oh my gosh, to getting myself to this event, had that reaction from the um, fellow delegate at the reaction, and I had two choices. I was right by the door. You know, I'm not comfortable wearing these shoes anyway. I could have just walked home and gone home and cried. But I thought, you know what? I made the effort to be here. This was not easy to get here and sign up and all the rest of the stuff that you get used to once you're back in again. I, I didn't find out why she did that. Yeah, what have I got to lose? You know, so I went out, I found her again, tapped her on the shoulder. I said, you know, can I just ask why you reacted that way? And she was really taken aback. She had no idea that was her reaction. And that's the thing, when you are that stay-at-home parent, whether you're a mom or dad is stay-at-home, you feel a lot that society treats you that way. You know, it may not be intentional, but that's how you feel. You feel like you are on the other foot. You feel like you're constantly trying to do yourself. You feel like you're not worthy. So that's how you feel. Now, on her side, and here's the thing, that was the perception in my head. I could have gone home and that would have been it in terms of my viewpoint. And, yep, I knew it. That was going to happen. But now I talked to her and then we got chatting. She was like, you know what? Um, I'm actually on my way out. I've, I'm literally popped in for 10 minutes to this event. Um, I'm, you know, she, she worked at a finance firm and she's looking to make a career move. And she goes, I literally had 10 minutes and I need to find someone in finance that I could chat to. Um, and then I'm going to be out of here. So her reaction was just bad. She recognized that we chatted about it. Um, she suddenly, then she found, you know, we talked about our background. She knew that it came from a goal background. And then suddenly she went, you BFF, you know, and then we changed details. And ironically, she became one of my first clients when I started UMA. So um, it's amazing how perceptions change if you take the time to not jump to conclusions. And this is something else I talk about in the book. I split that example, Rita, into two parts. The one, my perception bit of this is what happened. You know, this is what's going on. This is what life says. And then the second part later on is like perception. You take the time to actually question and think. You actually learn something different. And that's what the example told me. Um, and her issue was that, you know, she had her own confidence issues. She had a bad time in her team and she needed to move. Um, and then we just chatted and kind of figured out some examples. I introduced her to my old colleagues as well. Um, and then that was a very, very different part. But that's the point. That's one of, one of the ways that segmented that I need to be doing something to solve a problem. Because had I not, had I not decided to start UMA, I would be back on the same hamster wheel again. I would be like, oh, that's an issue going on, that's going on, but nothing is gonna change. Mm -hmm. I thought, I need to change this. I'm observing this in real time. I've gone through it. I can see others it's happening to. Mm -hmm. These are issues that are real, that stops people from progressing. Mm -hmm. I need to fo focus on that now. And that's the reason I thought I'm gonna start my own company. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So tell me about a typical UMA engagement. Um, yeah, great question. So um, there, there's two different kind of um, parts to our clientele. So we have um, quite a bit of coaching and mentoring. That's something that I was very, very adamant about. You know, I didn't have a mentor myself uh, when I was in my university days or very early on um, in, in the professional world. So I thought this is something that I can see. I've seen the difference it makes. So that's one part. So we have quite a few individual clients um, mm -hmm. that approach UMA. So, so kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching sort of thing? One-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring. So it's either myself or different team members. We have um, different offices, you know, um, in different parts of the world. We have India, we have the UK, we have West Coast here. Um, so it really depends on the background, who we kind of, they get paired up with. Um, quite often I'll, I'll do them myself as well um, when, I, when I have some time. Um, so that's one part. The second part is really the strategic um, consulting, which is what I say. And that's where we really deal with um, corporations, multinationals, um, academic institutions um, and policy forums. And it's really on the, um, I would say the diverse equity inclusion spectrum, but we're coming from a strategic perspective. What is going on? It's almost like being a fly on the wall. I would say from experience, Rita, that I would say about seven out of 10 times, the reason that companies called UMA in, called me in, and where the leak is actually coming from are two totally different things. So I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, a company approached us um, quite a few months ago and said, you know what, um, we've got this new uh, DEI diversity equity inclusion steering committee set up, and we've just had a you know our semi annual reviews, and the one heading it is she came up with really really bad reviews. I think we need to put her through unconscious bias training, and we need to do this because she's leading the initiative. Oh, let's get this done. So mm -hmm. spent some time with the team, um, heard different stakeholder viewpoints of this and spoke to the, the person in question 
And then I saw straight away that, you know what, she's overworked. She might be the steering committee here, but she's also doing a completely, she's doing a completely different job at the same time. This isn't all the only thing she's doing. So she's totally overworked, overwhelmed, million things going on, outside personal life going on as well. Phone calls ringing, emails, and she has no help, not delegating none of that. So totally just worked with her and other team members to say, okay, well, this is the perception. This is what's coming up. We need to work on her, just restructuring her day, helping her delegate what she's doing and a bit of communications there. So things like, you know, someone walks into the room. I gave you the example earlier and you know you're doing something, but for that two seconds, you've made an appointment. You put your phone down and just make eye contact and hi, how are you? And you know what? I'm so, so sorry, but something's come up last, last minute. Would you mind if we rescheduled? Look them in the eye when you say that. You can do that. It takes 10 seconds out of your day compared to looking down and not giving somebody an answer. You can still do that. People understand there's empathy on both sides. They, they, they value that you've taken the time to be transparent and communicate to them. So just little things like that um, made the difference. Absolutely. So, and that's just one example. So we're, 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 we like to find out where the leak is coming from, not just stick a Band-Aid on. So, um, and that's why holistically from a DEI perspective, I think a lot of the issues that we see is just communication, perception, taking the time to understand others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you, um, you would argue that um, you really can help organizations um, become more empathetic, you know, become yeah. places where people can sort of hear yeah. each other, where people feel that they can belong better. And I, you know, I, I sense such a hunger for that. Um, you know, the, I mean, the numbers, depending on which study that you read, it's you know, anywhere from 35 to 55 percent of the workforce is not engaged, don't feel their employer cares about them, don't feel they have a sense of agency, don't feel they have control over how they're spending their time. I mean, just, it's just bad. Um, so what do you think it's going to take to have companies take this agenda seriously? Because, you know, I mean, I work with a lot of corporations, and for a lot of them, it's still God, could everybody please stop whining and get back to work? I mean, you know, it's 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 um, it's not that they don't recognize their issues, but they don't think they're the top of the list. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, there is so, and this is such a vast spectrum. And I've got to be honest with you, Rita. The larger the company I work with, the more issues there are, and everybody tries to address them all at the same time, so nothing actually gets done. So a year later, you come back, and everyone's like, "Oh, how's that going?" And "Oh, what are the metrics looking like?" And nothing shifted. Um, or the metrics that they're measuring themselves on shouldn't be what they're measuring themselves on. So um, I always like try to look at wh where is the root coming from? So quite often I speak to companies and we start off by feeling the pulse. Let's see what the, what the folks on the ground are saying. Yes, I know the company might think we need to do this because in a way, shortcut, it's checking the box. But I want to know what's actually going on. What are the pain points? What's going on? So quite often doing surveys um, to start off um, to feel the pulse of what's going on in the company. What are they feeling? You know, uh, what are the issues? It, is it something like, you know, could it be just within a team? There's something going on. And is it just that team or is it like company wide? You can actually kind of figure out like, okay, these teams, they're all coming up with these sort of responses. That's coming up with that. It was only the hybrid folks. So it's only the in-person folks. And you can actually start to see themes and pain points. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, you get a better understanding of, okay, these are the issues we're dealing with. Now let's try to figure out what's a good way to, to um, deal with that. Some of it I like to do is once we've decided, okay, these are the pain points, get executives, senior leader, um, level leadership involved at the outset. Mm -hmm. So rather than send an email and say, hey, we're doing this, and then we'll say, oh, yep, okay, great. Actually sit down, doing a roundtable discussion, a practical um, role-playing, whatever you want, an interactive roundtable discussion with these senior folks so they actually get it and they – want to do it and they come up with ideas themselves because once they're invested in it and this is their company they got to feel that sense of uh, you know that ownership as well things can really really take a different direction mm -hmm. so once you have their blessing get them involved and this is what i'm thinking of doing what do you think mm -hmm. what about this and then they come up with ideas as well and then they're in it once you've got that then it's a lot easier to kind of organize training sessions discussions keynote talks focus groups, things like that, once you have that buy-in from senior leadership. And I can't stress that importance enough. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And then don't ignore that. And I talk about this in the book that when you're talking about uh, workplace culture, it's not just top down. It's very much grassroots, bottom up as well. 
So it's the folks on the ground, they redefine workplace culture, actually. You know, we talk about culture coming from top down. Yes, it does in many ways. And how a leader does something or talks in a town hall or says something really, really drives that perception. But so much so that so do people every day on the ground level. What's happening to bridge that gap? What are you doing to understand what folks on the ground are hearing and seeing every single day? And it's creating those points, not ignoring them, bringing them together together having sort of fun discussions with them on a frequent basis that can really make that change and bridge that gap. Um, and then the other thing based on that retry I talk about in the book as well is um, the decency quotient. And some of you guys are on, on today's webinar and might have heard that phrase, uh, something that I live and die by. You know, whereas once upon a time we talked about IQ defining, are you good enough for the workforce because you score a certain number, right? Um, do you have that level of intelligence needed? you know, then went on to the, you know, EQ, you know, how, you know, how much of an empathy does this person have? We want them to just kind of feel for other people. Now the kind of iteration, I would say is the combination of both, having that common sense, the intelligence element, and that understanding to have that decency quotient, which is basically, do you have that genuine desire to do right by others? So an example there, um, another client of mine, a, 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 um, a C-level exec, um, said to me that they, one of their teams had just people leaving. So I actually spent time with that team. I said, okay, what's going on here? Um, and, the, and the manager said, well, Rita, here's the situation. You know, we have somebody, we had a mum, she came back to the workforce and we did everything for her. Letting her like leave at 3 p.m. every day and all the rest of it. Um, but she ended up leaving. And you know what? We had lost other two people on the team. So I'm like, okay, can I get to see some of the exit interview scripts and whatnot? Can I even access, are you still in contact? Is there any way we can do that? So I managed to speak to the person who left the mum and um, this is the situation. So the mum felt embarrassed because she was called out. She wanted to get back to work. That was her desire. She wanted some sort of flexibility because now and again, she had to, to leave earlier. She was sort of um, uh, rotating with her partner in terms of who does pickups and things, but she didn't want to be called out for it. She wanted to get on with her work. Similarly, the rest of the team members, they're like, I'm here day in, day out. Why does she get special treatment? So mm -hmm. resentment built up. Mm -hmm. And it happened and happened and happened, and it kept going on. So boom, three people left within the span of a month. Mm -hmm. So it was quite, quite a bad thing. So I said, you know what? Um, they showed that, that leader showed empathy. Yeah. Did they show decency? Zip, zero. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to that leader. I said, what could have happened? had you, you relive the situation is you can absolutely help out this you know person coming back but have a team meeting you know you openly talk about work-life balance you all openly talk about people having hobbies nobody here's got a hobby why not or you know find out what they like to do oh that one there likes to play tennis when was the last time they did or they can't why because they've got to get to the court at 4 30 on a friday i said well here's one thing you could do or could have done going forward and in the future you can tell this you know person like you can leave now and again, but I want every single person here to have that one day, whenever they can, it doesn't have to be all the time, to show you're making the effort to acknowledge they have lives outside work too. You care about them. That one person that plays tennis, oh, that one plays the drums. This one doesn't have a hobby. Well, maybe, maybe let's figure out a time so they can go find a hobby. You know, things like that brings everybody together. Then all of a sudden, there's no resentment. Mm -hmm. Everyone understands each other. And the manager is thinking, genuinely doing right by others by putting them all first where it should be. It shouldn't be just singling out one person. Mm -hmm. So just little things like that. It's, it's nuanced. It's very subtle. It's some people think they get and they don't. But it's just little, little conversations like that that can make or break an entire experience and the bottom line of a company from losing people to retaining and keeping people going forward. Yeah, I'll never forget. I was working with a CFO, uh, mm. well, CFO can, and a CFO candidate uh, who was a woman, very, um, very, you know, rocket science, very high potential at a big chemical company. And her, she confided me she was going to leave. And I said, well, why? You know, you're on this fast track. Things are going so well. Like they've made every accommodation. She said, no, it's my boss who mm. every Friday um, insists that his, his team meeting is going to be at 7 a.m. And um, that was when, you know, and it was all historical. It, that was when the shifts changed. It was a couple of hours before customer calls started coming in. So from his perspective, that was a perfect time to have his staff meeting because, you know, it was quiet. The, the customers weren't there. The shift had just changed. You know, it was like the beginning of the day. And she said, look, my daycare doesn't open 
till 7.30. Um, and so once a week, I'm in this horrible situation where I've got to get the kids out of bed like super early. My husband's on deck for, you know, doing all this stuff. He didn't sign up for that. She said, and it's it's completely pointless. And so once, uh, you know, one day out of every five I'm spending at work is an absolute horror show for me. And, and she said, and I've spoken about it. And they've said, well, what are you talking about? And she said, I felt, you know, I feel ashamed to bring it up. Um, mm. but at the same time, I'm, I can't, I can't live this way. Mm. <laughs> you know? And it's sometimes like just thunderingly obvious, like we could have had the meeting at nine. It wouldn't have been the end of the world. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, Gosh, so. It's so many, so many examples like that. Rita. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this is your new thing. That's what you're doing. And how's, how's it going? I love it. I mean, I've been doing it for six and a half years now. So it, feel, it always feels new because I have that level of energy and excitement every time I do anything. But I just love it because I see the differences. It's all about, you know, not just sort of going day in and day out to, to my, my job, but you actually see the difference. You know, somebody that you've coached has that spring in the step. A company changes the entire direction or something changes where they've got better retention stats or folks have come to them and said, we really like that or that little gesture. That's what the difference is. That makes it worthwhile. Um, and you get to see that a lot easier when you, when you have your own business, I guess. So, yeah, I love it. <laughs> so the book is called The Goddess of Go-Getting. Um, that's what it looks like. And where do people go to learn more about your work as, as we unfortunately have to begin wrapping up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we have um, our website, um, Be Bold beuma.com. That's B-E-B-O-L-D, B-E-U-M-A.com. Um, so feel free to check it out. Um, I have my personal website as well, which is ritakakartishah.com and, and you can get to Uma that way too. Great. So, we put so, yeah. some links in the chat for those of you that are listening. Um, and so people can reach you. They, they can connect with you uh, on LinkedIn. On your website. LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn too. Just, just look for Rita Kakati Shah and hopefully it pops up. Brilliant. And so the last anecdote I wanted to recall from the book was um, you said, you know, if you were in Britain, right, and there was a thing like a royal wedding happening, you would have like maybe had it on the news, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but the fact that you were here meant you had to go to the only British bar <laughs> and watch the whole royal oh, wedding. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah talk about the lengths people will go to feel a sense of belonging <laughs> oh, totally, absolutely yeah so you feel like a sense of patriotism um exactly when you don't feel that sense of belonging you will go extra miles to do anything you can to get there so absolutely yeah. that's a great thought to end us on well thank you so much have a lovely weekend everyone and thank you for joining us um i think this is our last fireside chat of the year so thank you very much for being my my guest rita thank you so much for having me thanks everyone and thanks for the questions Hey, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.